Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar on aged care quality standards. This is our second session today. Uh, welcome to all the home care operators who are joining us for our second session today. Looking at what does the move to an outcomes focus in the quality standards mean for providers of aged services. My name's Brendan Moore, I'm the General Manager for Business Support Services and State Manager for New South Wales and ACT and I'll be facilitating today's webinar with our Principal Advisor, Troy Spears. Welcome, Troy. Welcome. Thanks, Brendan. <clears throat> Just uh, on screen in our uh, PowerPoint slides, we've got a 30-minute presentation. Uh, we'll be going through the conceptual approach for navigating the transition to the new standards for home care providers, how you might demonstrate evidence of consumer outcomes using a framework, and accessing additional support in the transition process and how LASER is supporting its members through this uh, coming eight months or so until we transition on the 1st of July 2019. We've got uh, 15 minutes set aside for questions or discussion. Uh, please submit your questions during the presentation. What worked quite well for us in the residential session that we've just run is I'll keep an eye on the questions as they come in and we'll answer them uh, as soon as we possibly can. So uh, we'll be interacting with you as we go. So please ask us questions as we're going through. We're also um, in this presentation looking at um, the aged care quality standards. We're assuming a certain level of knowledge in our audience uh, in terms of uh, base level of understanding of some obviously the old standards, uh, a little bit around the new standards as well and we're doing a little bit of a dive into um, a specific area that laser staff have identified is quite a significant change for the industry which is moving to outcomes focus for consumers. So that's the main focus for us this afternoon. Um, so in terms of the aged care quality standards, uh, most of you should be familiar with that we have four program specific standards and they focus on assessing performance against practices and processes for care delivery. So we'll be talking a little bit about practices and processes as well, we won't be ignoring that, uh, but certainly making the shift to the focus on outcomes as part of this new single set of aged care quality standards that we're moving away from the four separate standards listed there on the slide. And what we're seeing uh, in the future is a need for providers to demonstrate evidence across practices, processes and outcomes mapped against each of the eight standards. So I'm going to throw to Troy now just with a question around what do these practices and processes look like now for home care operators and um, what are providers doing now to demonstrate compliance? Yeah. Thanks Brendan. Um, afternoon everyone. Um, in terms of the practices and processes that we map, there is a guide out that was released by the Quality Agency in the past and they very much look at our policies and procedures and the kind of things we capture are information around number of staff trained, um, care plans in place, home care agreements written and signed by the consumer, consent sought, um, emergency response contacts are in place, um, care plan reviews are done, clinical care is implemented with a nurse and, and GPs and others. So they're very much around processes and procedures. And to be honest, when I compare the practices and processes of home care to the results and processes of residential care, the residential care, the current residential care guide is a lot more closer to where we're going with the aged care standards. So there's a little bit of legwork for home care providers to do in terms of getting to that process for looking at outcomes. Some will be, some people will be doing it. They've, they've developed that that approach, but in terms of minimum requirements, the practices and processes guides fall quite short from looking at outcomes. So it won't be sufficient to stay as you are. You're going to have to do something different. Let's look at the aged care quality standards. Uh, just a quick overview of what they actually are. Right in the centre we have consumer dignity and choice. Uh, this has been one of the main features of this transition to a new set of quality standards is that the consumer is at the centre of the standards and the framework and how they interact and how they've been constructed to work together. Around the outside in this diagram we have seven other standards. So we have ongoing assessment and planning with consumers, personal care and clinical care, services and supports for daily living, the organisation service environment, feedback and complaints, human resources, 
organisational governance is our final eight standard. Now it should just be pointed out briefly that not all of these apply in totality to home and community care operators. Uh, so if you uh, need to know more detail about that, um, you can contact LASER for more support around what it means for you in terms of the details. But we don't have time to dwell on that today, so we'll just keep on moving ahead. So in terms of the aged care quality standards, each of the quality standards is expressed in three ways. So it starts with a statement of outcome for the consumer for each of those standards. It then goes on to describe a statement of expectation for the organisation and then further unpacking the organisational requirements to demonstrate that the standard has been met. Towards the end of this webinar, we'll actually uh, show you what that looks like against our little framework. So we'll have a little bit more detail for you on how that works a little bit later on. And then performance and evaluative measures or evidence need to be mapped against each of the expressions for each quality standard. So Troy, how are these measures need to be different to what is collected now? Sure. So when we look at the guidance materials and their reference to the statement of outcome, the statement of expectation and organisational requirements, when we drill down to the detail behind the organisational requirements in the guidance material, they very much look similar to the kinds of processes and practices that we've traditionally captured. It's the ability to extend beyond those practices and processes that we might currently capture as evidence and actually looking at are there additional things we need to be doing or things to be doing differently to better demonstrate our evidence against these three expressions of each quality standard. Thanks Troy. We're now going to introduce a uh, conceptual approach to navigate the transition in terms of moving through this uh, cascading hierarchy of process through outcome to impact evaluation. Troy, over to you to describe this in a bit more detail and what it actually means. Thanks, Brendan. Um, so there's three, we've chosen a very simplistic approach to outcome evaluation to help providers start to move into this process of thinking about demonstrating um, outcomes and it's a public health approach. We often see it in health promotion. Um, it talks about three levels of evaluation or three levels of evidence. Process evaluation, outcome evaluation, and impact evaluation. And we're going to go through each of these levels so you can have a little bit more understanding regarding what we're doing. But we're distinguishing between our performance or our evaluation me measures at each level to assist in mapping evidence. For example, we might want staff to be um, doing what would be called manual handling. And this is very much around ensuring that there are no injuries for staff, but no injuries for consumers as we start to deliver care in the home. Knowing that at home, it's a very autonomous um, operational environment and staff need to be very alert and aware what's going on. So at a process, we deliver training. Um, and then the number of staff trained translates to what we might call an output. But the real outcome is actually seeing less injuries and a consumer being able to be mobile in the home. So that's, that's a way of thinking about process translates to outcome. We're very good at demonstrating process. The challenge is how do we articulate an outcome? And this is a, a framework that's going to help us to understand that as we navigate the transition. So let's have a look now at our first level of evidence, the process evaluation. Measures of a process um, for delivery of aged care services might be things we describe as assessments being conducted for each client, care plans being developed and reviewed for each client, scheduling of care visits being completed, recruitment and training of staff to deliver the care they need to do consistent with care plans, complaints, response, and communication to consumers about their rights to make complaints and the response that the organisation will have. And then we have a whole range of policies and procedures and work instructions to support care delivery in the home. All the kinds of things that we currently capture data and report through quality review are consistent with these processes. And we've traditionally been accredited against implementation of these processes to demonstrate our evidence against the home care standards. And when we look at what do we need to capture, 
It's very much driven by what's articulated in the practices and processes guide. So that's where we are as an industry at the moment in terms of process. So Troy, should providers be rethinking their indicators and their data collection at this level, given they've been very familiar with capturing information and data around process, are we throwing the baby out with the bathwater here or are we keeping this level of information? Look, I, think, I think we're keeping this level of information. It's about how to c capture it more smartly, more efficiently. One of the biggest challenges we have with compliance and quality assurance is we're capturing data. We get a reviewer come in and say, you need to sh demonstrate this, demonstrate that, and we will develop a new system. So there is an opportunity in this transition to look at can we be more smarter and more efficient in the way we do things. And often that might mean using technology, but it, that's really dependent very much on the size of your organisation and the capability within your organisation as to what you actually do at this level. So there is a little bit of variability, but we're definitely not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Thanks, Troy. And just a reminder to everyone participating, please keep your questions coming in and we'll address them as we go. Uh, please, Troy, continue on to our next slide on outputs. Now, the, the next thing we need to understand as part of process is the outputs. So key outputs within the practices and processes guide are also referenced. Things like tracking the reach of a service. So we might be able to say how many males we service, how many females we service, what the average age is. They're all the kinds of outputs regarding the reach of our service. We also track the, track the level of implementation of all aspects, aspects of our service. So for example, do consumers have a behavioural um, intervention plan where there are behaviours of concern for consumers or loved ones, um, where there may be cognitive impairment? Or do we have a false risk plan in place and, and a review and an assessment of that? They're all the kinds of outputs. The question is, how does a, a review or a plan generate an outcome for a consumer? It's, the review in itself is an output. It is not an outcome for the consumer. And I think we need to be really clear that this level of evidence is not going to be sufficient in demonstrating outcomes for consumers. We need to extend further beyond what we currently might be able to collect and demonstrate quite well. And, and this is where, when we identify gaps, we might start to use um, continuous improvement to be able to uh, develop that. So examples of, of the indicators we might be using at process, around the process or the outputs, key service documents. You know, the number of risks that we've identified and how we've responded to that. Focus groups, how many consumers were consulted, how many care, primary carers were consulted. How many staff were consulted? The, the, the annual staff survey, what was the feedback of that? Observational inquiry and also other reportable data. Many of these fall into the area of outputs and they may not actually be able to clearly articulate, but how did that translate to the outcome for the consumer? And some further uh, basic level uh, descriptors of outputs uh, would be hours of care, meals provided, trips driven, newsletters provided to uh, clients, your monthly statements, decisions made by your board. Uh, they are all uh, outputs of some form that most people will be familiar with, but you may not necessarily have thought of them in this uh, manner in terms of the framework that we're presenting to you today. All right, Troy, let's get into the more meaty stuff around outcomes. This okay. is where it gets hard. So now we start to look at how do we demonstrate outcomes for the consumer? Well, an outcome is a measure of status of, or change in a consumer's attitude, behaviour or condition that's sought after through the delivery of aged care services. And typically we might see these as the goals in our care plans for our consumers. So the question is we need to be able to articulate in our care plans what's measurable. Is it the status or is it a change in consumer attitude, behaviour or condition? Now one of the common things we do measure that is an outcome is consumer satisfaction. It's one of the things we do and it's a, it's a measure of attitude or measure of perception. But as you know, consumers who are under distress or in difficulty may have some level of distortion of perception that may not reflect accurately what's done. And then our challenge is to be able to respond to that consumer feedback and our documentation is often the next level of evidence 
to clarify what's actually happened and seek resolution in those issues. So it's really important that we don't just rely on satisfactions, customer satisfaction surveys as the only measure of outcome. There needs to be other ways of thinking about outcomes. For example, mobility. So we could be looking at behavioural measure around numbers of falls. If there is a client with a high number of falls over a last 12 month period, are we able to implement some um, muscle strengthening training or other programs with the support of OTs and physios that see a reduction in falls? Do we re look at the issue of polypharmacy and reduce the number of medications that might contribute to falls? These are all the kinds of things you might address within a care plan to try and improve um, and demonstrate outcomes. Uh, one thing that I know home care providers have, have talked about is the idea of goal attainment scaling. It's the idea of taking a goal, finding a way to articulate it as, as a measurable, so simple, measurable, achievable, realistic, timely. It's an acronym we often have heard of in consumer directed care called SMART. And it's how can we articulate a scale to measure whether a goal has been achieved or not. On day one, it might be a low score. On, on day if three months down the track, it could be a better score. That's how we can demonstrate outcomes. So it's really about the sophistication in our care plans, not just ticking the box. And I think this is where we're going to start to be driven in terms of consumer-directed care. Thanks, Troy. Uh, you described a few uh, outcome measures there, and um, you know, satisfaction is very commonly measured by a net promoter score. Uh, we've seen um, some great results being achieved by retirement villages, residential aged care and home care providers with net promoter scores. Uh, we've also seen the advent of new technology, such as the Pain Check app, which is a great way of recording outcomes. And then Bartels, I know from my own personal experience, the transition aged care programs across uh, New South Wales have certainly used the Bartels as a way of uh, demonstrating functional gain improvement in their uh, clients, whether they be in the home or in a residential setting. Uh, and that uh, outcome aggregating that data of all the different clients and their Bartell score on entry and on exit from the Transition Aged Care Program is a really simple, straightforward way of demonstrating an outcome. How is this info data being used now around outcomes and will this change under the new standards? Yeah, good, good point, Brendan. This brings us to the next slide, which is very much around when we look at those outcomes, we can demonstrate it for an individual. We can have quality reviewers come in and we can give them a sample of five client files. They can review it and they can really see those specific milestones that indicate progress in consumer outcomes relative to their plan. The challenge for us now is to take common milestones. For example, number of falls across consumers, number of behaviours of concern. It could be level of social isolation or social connectedness depending on whether you want to frame it as a wellness and reablement term or a deficit kind of term. And these start to bring us to more generic milestones or measures to indicate consumer outcomes for a broader population and to whom we deliver services. So we might be able to say a certain percentage of our consumers are receiving a particular care product and are getting these kinds of outcomes. And that's the kind of thing we need to start to developing is that way of thinking, how can we take the specifics and develop something more broadly that actually can be used for marketing in a competitive commercial home care environment? And there's a bit of a tension in the um, new standards uh, around uh, its emphasis on each consumer, each care recipient, each client, whichever language you prefer to use. Uh, but there's a reference to each. Now when you're talking about each individual, you're not talking about outcomes in the aggregate sense. How can providers capture outcome measures for each consumer? Yeah, good point. I guess this is where we need to look at our mapping processes around processes, outputs and outcomes. My question would be, what is an outcome that is common across lots of consumers but very important for the individual? For example, having access to information is an output, but the consumer being able to make an informed choice is an outcome. So we want that and we need to demonstrate our ability to do that. The way we do that is often a customer survey. Were you provided information? Do you feel you can make um, the choices around how your care is delivered? 
do you understand your rights and responsibilities for, for care? They're all part of that client onboarding process and the importance of giving consumers information and clarity so they feel they understand how they contribute in terms of choice and dignity. And we're seeing uh, in the home care market particularly uh, specialisation, uh, differentiation, targeting if you like, around uh, the client base um, either by geography, ethnicity, language, culture, um, whatever it may be. So you may actually also want to target your outcome evaluation to support your broader strategy that you're yeah. looking for to demonstrate your capability and performance as a provider that is meeting the needs of that particular niche target population. And the other exciting point about this is that with a focus on wellness and reablement really starting to come through in home care, it's the ability to demonstrate some of these opportunities for, for older people in terms of functional gain or in terms of social inclusion where you can really demonstrate that value add relative to your market competitors. And this is where we now need to start to think about is what are the outcome measures that we would get better value and return on to demonstrate outcomes but also contribute to our marketing. So I think this is an opportunity providers really need to be thinking about in terms of clearly understanding the types of evidence they're going to bring to forward in terms of demonstrating um, outcomes, but not just that, developing a brand and a messaging. So this is where we start to move to impact evaluation. Focus is on the long-term sustained goal attainment, demonstrating consistent delivery of aged care services to multiple consumers. So if you're offering outings and social activities, and people are indicating they're feeling connected with their communities, that's a broad outcome that you can demonstrate as part of your brand and marketing. We support our consumers to age in place. We ad address key target areas at, um, through these kinds of programs. Community gyms, we know there are some providers that are looking at those kinds of gym access to gyms to, to support um, issues around resistance training. So it's often identifying these milestones that will be good for multiple consumers, demonstrating trends over time, noting that there are common goals um, that can be used as part of outcome evaluation, and developing trend data. So you have constantly saying high levels of satisfaction, high levels of, of consumer outcomes in terms of health status. These are the things that are really important as part of saying this is how we support our community. And this is a, obviously very high level uh, information and moving into what is often described as social impact or social return on investment of an organisation. As you've been mentioning, it's very important information for an organisation's ongoing marketing efforts, public relations campaigns, funding applications. We're seeing some innovative funding emerge in uh, terms of social impact bonds, social return on investment models. So that's exciting to see. And if you're capturing this information, you're much better placed to uh, capitalise on those opportunities. And I should also make a shameless plug that if you are capturing social impact data, it's also great material for laser awards and nominations. So please uh, get this impact evaluation information in uh, into your organisation and get your awards nominations in. Let's move ahead to our next slide. So very much at um, a very basic level around nav navigation transition, we have these three levels of evidence, process, outcome and impact. And process builds to outcome, which is at the individual level, but also can be at some group level. But then we develop that to a broader impact messaging. So what we need to do at the moment in the, in the lead up to 1 July is map our levels of evidence to determine whether they are currently in scope and satisfactory, whether they're in need of revision or are identified as there have been gaps in the evidence that we need to actively address in the lead up to 1 July. And this is traditionally the process of self-assessment against guidance materials. Now we're waiting currently for the government to rele release their self-assessment checklist but we haven't heard as to when that will be done and we're, we're just waiting on that. But it shouldn't stop us from moving forward and in, to this extent, Laser's looking to develop a set of training and masterclass products to take to market in 2019 that can help us with this self-assessment process. So let's go and have a look a little bit at where we're going with this. 
So at first we now have the guidance and resources for providers to support the new aged care quality standards. It includes some re reflective questions and examples of actions and evidence and the quality agency have run their getting to know your um, standards introductory workshop. The guide can assist with mapping of current performance and evaluative measures. If we look at the requirements, they very much reflect similar things to processes but also some outputs. But then we have the overall statement of expectation for the organisation and above that we have the outcome for the consumer. So this is where we need to go through self-assessment. So let's have a look here. Here's an example of a template that would be very easy for you to generate yourself, which states for each of the eight standards, and this is standard three, personal and clinical care, the consumer outcome, I get personal care, clinical care or both, that's safe and right for me, the organisational expectation, the organisation delivers safe and effective personal and clinical care, and then the organisational requirements. Each consumer gets safe and effective personal care, effective management of high impact and high prevalence risks, and there are a number of other requirements that would scroll down that page. The idea is that you can then look at your current processes, outputs and outcomes that you've documented against past quality reviews and start to map them in against these. And what you will probably find is you'll have lots of detail at process, probably lots of deal at output, some detail at outcome, and some detail at impact. The question then comes is what do I have at outcome and impact? Does it meet that consumer outcome? Does it meet that organisational expectation? Are there gaps? And this is the process we should be looking at at the moment. So Troy, let's uh, try to put a bit of detail into this uh, in the interest of uh, time. So if we're looking at 3.2, effective management of high impact sure. or high prevalence risks associated with the care of each consumer. And I'm going to pick balls because we've just talked about that previously. So if we look at um, a process around balls, you might have a process around A, a policy. Uh, B, you might run some training as a process of educating your staff. Um, any other processes that you might put in place sure. for calls? So given high risk, you might be looking at whether an assessment indicates you need two-person mm -hmm. assist, whether there is funds in the budget to be able to facilitate that, and if there isn't, what's the advice you provide to the consumer around the choices that they have within financial constraints? It could be a conversation about contributing more to the cost of care. It could be looking at other, other forms of care that may be more appropriate. You might be looking at the feasibility of a hoist or some other kinds of technology solution to assist around falls risk. It could be polypharmacy. Is a client on multiple medications and do we need to look at trying to, to pull that back? And there are products that are there to help achieve the outputs, which could be, um, you know, the care plan's been reviewed, it's been updated, staff have been supported, um, carers and the client have been educated, and then the outcomes. Are we seeing a reduction in falls mm. over a period of time? Is there strength and resistance training that's actually seen the client develop a sense of capability that they weren't able to have before? Mm. They're all very individualised approach. But if you have a, a number of clients with this kind of presentation, you might be able to think about, well, is there a generic me measure for falls that we could actually use to demonstrate um, an outcome for a broader group of, of our home care clients. And if we take that right up to the uh, point of uh, looking at impacts around reducing falls, say you achieve a 5% reduction in falls year on year, then from an in as an outcome, then as an impact statement, you can actually look at um, evidence-based research around the cost of uh, admission to hospital, the quality of life years um, impacted by, and you can actually quantify numbers that then put an impact on your outcome. So you can say, well, we've saved the hospital system thousands of dollars, X many thousands of dollars, for achieving that falls reduction. We've achieved, a, um, in terms of the public policy impact, but from an individual impact, you've given them um, X many quality of life years in addition to what they would ordinarily have experienced, but not by having a fall. Their lives are improved. And this is, this is the really key point I think you're making, Brendan, is that this is about how do I get myself to stand out from my competitors. This is a commercial market 
it's still maturing, it's still early days, we're talking about home care pricing and we're acknowledging that you can't have price without understanding what quality is. So this is an opportunity for us to invest in articulating quality to demonstrate what the price point is really worth. And as we see workforce resources become tighter and tighter, then quality is going to become more important as consumers start to choose. Do I want a good quality product or am I just going to take the average because that's all available? And having this sort of framework and uh, language that we're using starts to take us away from what's been described as a race to the bottom on price. So we're going to start seeing a bit more uh, sophistication in the information and the communication that you're able to say and say, well, this is my point of difference. This is the value I create. This is the um, uh, happy customers that I've got. And this is the difference I've made in their life and the outcomes that they speak of. That's why you should choose me. That's why I'm X many dollars more expensive per hour than the other provider down the street that you might be able to choose. Yeah, great, great point, Brendan. It very much is the case now that we need to articulate our offering and this provides a framework to move from the tick box to actually saying, well, it's not just about meeting the standards. It's about thinking strategically about the information we capture to go to the consumer and say why you should choose me. Excellent point. Thanks, Troy. Just a reminder to everyone that's joining us on the webinar today, please get your questions in. We've run through our half an hour. Uh, we've still got a little bit to go, but we're very keen to answer any questions that you might have. So please get your questions in before our webinar time expires today. And what I'll say also, Brendan, is at the moment, Laser is developing a masterclass series to, to take to market in the new year, similar to the masterclasses we have run previously but really looking at using that kind of self-assessment checklist to bring home care providers together and as an industry start to think about process, outcome and impact. I recall a time when I was involved within um, the Department of Health with Health Promotion and we had these evalu program evaluation frameworks where you would sit down with colleagues, they'd have their own service, their own goal, but we'd actually start to be talking about evaluation and ways of measuring things. And what you do is we develop the industry cap capability to do this well. This is really what it is. We do quality, it's now about how do we articulate quality. And there's a framework and an opportunity for LASER and its members to come together and actually support each other to develop this capability. And I think this is how we're going to really start to support maturation of the market and preparation to engage consumers in a more useful way. Thanks, Troy. And that leads us into our last slide here on the next steps for LASER. So um, Troy's uh, just mentioned some of the work we can do. So our organisation transition consulting support can include working with you around um, developing a more comprehensive evaluation and uh, program logic model uh, for your services that build on the example that we very briefly just touched on around standard three. There's much more to it than that if you're interested in our support in that area. Um, also, we've made commitments to producing a policy and procedure manual and we hope to have that out in market by the end of February. We're also uh, looking at quality audits, continuous improvement planning to align with the new standards and friendly unannounced visits for compliance auditing. That's certainly a very frequently requested service of laser consultants at the moment. Uh, and so happy to help you in those areas, including looking at those unannounced visits um, coinciding with compliance auditing, auditing for the current standards, but also then what needs to be done in gap analysis and transitioning to the new standards. There's also a series of governance workshops that are being scheduled across the country in partnership with the Governance Institute of Australia. We, as well as seeing that outcomes is a big focus of the new standards, we're certainly seeing governance is a much greater focus for the new standards. So we would encourage uh, your organisations and your boards to attend those if you can. I believe they're very well attended, so you may not be able to squeak into those yet, but we will be running more of them due to the popularity of those courses. Uh, back to the top of the um, slide here that LASER has and we will continue to deliver webinar opportunities for members, so such as this one. We hope you found this instructive and informative uh, and if you are interested in more webinars, please let us know what you would like us to provide for you. We have also provided overview presentations at regional forums, uh, other member engagements and on requests into specific um, services organisations. 
and we're offering master classes around the country and they are available on request to organisations to begin the journey for you around transitioning to the new standards. Uh, and so for any variety of these particular services, there's contact numbers there, there's the traditional 1300 111 636 number. If failing anything else, you call that number, you'll get in touch with the person that can help you. Um, for the events, presentations and masterclasses, there's the events at laser.asn.au email address. And for any of the consulting services listed there, um, quality at laser.asn.au and we're able to uh, meet your needs. So we're just uh, starting to get a couple of questions coming in now in question time. So firstly, will the webinar be available? Absolutely, the webinar will be available. Um, it's being recorded and so the slides and the recording will be made available after the session concludes today. And then we've got another question here from Catherine. Other than client surveys, what are some examples of measuring impacts of wellness and reablement approaches? For example, measuring impact of the process of doing with client rather than doing for client. Excellent question, Catherine. I'll throw that to Troy. Thanks, Brendan. Great question, Catherine, and thank you for asking it. So there's two different ways to think about these kinds of measures for um, impacts or, or outcomes. So if we take the example of doing with the client, the question um, really comes up is, is there a standardised measure we could use? For example, there's a social inclusion measure called the ASCOT and there are other measures as well of wellness. So we might look at a, a wellness mood scale, a depression or anxiety scale. Um, there may be a range of different measures that are out there that providers are using and, and we really want short, sharp measures that are not too difficult. We see often it might be the carers who are filling them out, not so much the clients because of the burden. But the other way to think about it is if there isn't a measure there, there's a concept called goal attainment scaling. And this is the opportunity for you to generate measures specific to a care plan to measure change. It challenges you to think about how do we articulate a goal and how do we articulate how we will measure whether that goal has been achieved? What would we expect at day one? What would we expect 12, 12, um, sorry, 12 weeks later or six weeks later? What is, the goal, what is the goal the client would hope to achieve? A classic example is, okay, I have had a fall, I've come out of hospital, I want to start to be able to walk more, so I'm going to practice walking to my letterbox. I've got to navigate a couple of stairs and I've got to walk 30 metres to the, to the letterbox and walk back. And you might work with a physiotherapist to develop some, some muscle strength in the activity and start to implement that. So you can develop a goal attainment scale to measure the client's ability to achieve. Have I achieved that outcome? Have I partially achieved that outcome? Have I not achieved that outcome? So you develop your own scale specific to a client. It's often a very useful way of thinking about how do we extend care plans to demonstrate outcomes. But as your organisation becomes more sophisticated, you may you choose a standard measure or you may choose to collect group data that uses a similar kind of goal and actually try to measure, collect the information at a group level to do that. The key issue I would say at this point though is don't overcomplicate it. Keep it simple, keep it focused, on getting yourself into outcomes and then as it matures there are opportunities to grow that way of developing your products. We're just talking about transition in the next six months. It's, it's, it's the commercialisation of these products will come with time. And it's a good idea now to start with uh, um, capturing baseline data um, and you've got uh, seven, eight months or so to capture baseline data and then when the transition point uh, occurs on the 1st of July, you'll have a ream of data available that suggests you're already there, uh, you're already demonstrating consumer outcomes and how your programs and your activities are supporting that. Um, we've got another question coming in from uh, Graham. How is this additional work funded under the CHSP framework? Good question, Graham, thank you. I've asked this question of the department and the understanding is that home care providers should be able to do this within their resources. It's not requiring a significant amount of change. Um, so this is why I'd be saying do the mapping and look at some simple prioritised outcome measures 
so that when quality review comes around, you can demonstrate it. And, and this is the thing. We're not so much around focusing on government funding to do this. It's very much around adjusting our current process. And we do know that there is a legitimate package management fee that needs to be charged as part of home care packages. And under CHSP, this should be accounted for within the funding framework. Now, I know that perhaps some CHSP providers have not operated like this, and we know that um, CHSP contract renewals are coming up in 2020. So it's probably more a matter of looking at the financial limitations of what you can do and focusing on a few items that you can do well to demonstrate outcomes. But the mapping is the key issue. If you don't do that well, then there may be gaps and the quality review will pick that up. And there is already a um, fair volume of uh, information available, reports, evaluation uh, reports that have been done from other programs uh, that we could certainly encourage you to um, mimic, plagiarise uh, their methodologies that they're using to generate the data that they've um, been able to obtain through their work. So another question that has just come in is, is LASER able to provide a template for recording this baseline data? Yeah, great question, Catherine. Um, this is where we need to acknowledge that different organisations are different sizes, have different ways of doing business, and I would think your baseline data needs to be very individualised to your organisation and your mission and your purpose. And so that way I would say if you're wanting to look at that, it's probably a matter of if you want support to do that, LASER can do that, but it will probably happen through our business support services. I know we have had some members that want us to do quality reviews and what they we're doing in that is we're identifying key items that we can recommend for people in going forward. So if you, if you are interested in getting some support to think a little bit more um, focused about evaluation and moving forward, LASER can definitely help you with that. Yeah, and from my personal perspective as the General Manager of Business Support Services, I um, help members with strategic planning work and I always start from the point of purpose, come back to your purpose. And so any efforts in a change exercise in terms of operational implementation change comes back to your strategy, comes back to your purpose. What are you trying to achieve uh, from an organisational perspective? Why do you exist? What difference are you trying to make? And then how does that convert into your strategy? So yeah, reference choice comments there. It should be individualised and it should come back to what you're trying to achieve and the purpose you have as an organisation. We're coming rapidly to the end of our session uh, today in this webinar and we have time for any other questions. If people have got fast fingers that they can type a question very quickly for us, but otherwise we are running out of time. And so I just throw to Troy for a, a concluding comment whilst anyone with fast fingers can type a final question for us. Thanks, Brendan. You know, it, it's an interesting time moving from um, uh, what we might call a cottage industry to a commercial industry. Um, evaluation frameworks are one of the things that when you start to think about grabbing funding and moving forward to deliver an outcome, you want to develop your evaluation framework up front. What we're doing with this transition to the new standards is really saying, all right, we need to take stock around are the items that we're capturing evidence about at those three levels, process, outcome and impact, the right measures. Or when we think about our, la, our the experience of consumer directed care since 2015, should, should we be rethinking about it? So I think there's an opportune time to be thinking about, are we doing things the right way? Should we be looking at changing things up a bit? And, and the, the good thing about, I know about change is, if you're going to fail, fail quickly, but learn as you go. And I think this is the challenge. How can we do change in this transition cost effectively, resource effectively, but moving us in the right direction to help us to mature for the commercial market. And on that point, uh, that brings us to the end of the webinar. Uh, there were no people with fast fingers that managed to get a final question in. So thank you very much for joining us today in uh, this webinar on the aged care quality standards with a bit of a brief view 
of moving to an outcomes uh, focus and a framework that will capture that information and be able to demonstrate your, both your performance but also the value it can add to your organisation in terms of um, it's reaffirming your strategy and your purpose and what you're trying to achieve for your consumers. So thanks very much. We hope you found it informative and va valuable for you today. As I said earlier, if you have any other further ideas about what you would like LASER to present webinars on, please don't hesitate to let us know. Uh, we are here to help you and uh, we hope, again, you found today very useful. Thank you and goodbye.